In this video, I'm gonna show you how to build a stone veneer fireplace start to finish, step by step. So we're gonna be going over how to frame the fireplace, how to do the scratch coat, how to apply the stone veneer, how to do the hearth, the mantle, the whole nine yards. So if you're new to this channel, my name's Josh. The channel's all about building your own house, saving a ton of money. So be sure to subscribe, ring the bell so you get a notification every time I release a new video, and hammer that like button for me. That's all I ask in return for making this video. So we got a lot to do, so let's get started. Since there's going to be a ton of information in this video, I put timestamps below so that that way you can jump to different sections if you're using this as a step-by-step -step guide. The type of fireplace I'm building is a gas log fireplace. That's the only way wood construction would work here because clearly you would not frame it out of wood if you're doing this for wood burning fireplace that needs a chimney and everything else. That's for a whole other video. So this is just for gas logs. So you need to pick whether you want a vented or ventless fireplace. I chose ventless because I have vented fireplaces in my other houses, but I did not really need them because I didn't burn them all the time. So for what we need it for, ventless was fine. So that's what we chose. So after you choose what you want as far as vented or ventless, you need to pick the exact model because that's gonna give you the rough framing that you need to do for the opening in which you need to set your fireplace in. And this is called a firebox, by the way. This is gonna hold the gas logs. So those are coming at a later date, but you need to pick the exact model because the framing is going to be determined due to the model that you pick. So again, every brand is gonna be different, but this shows you the exact framing in which you need to do in order to have the correct clearances and rough openings. After you determine the depth of your rough opening, you need to determine if you want a hearth or not. In my case, I like an elevated hearth. So as you can see, I built this out of two by 10, so it elevates it up about 10 inches off the floor because I like to be able to have a place to sit on, talk, drink coffee, or some people just put the hearthstone right on the floor, which is fine too. Either way, you need to make sure you elevate your firebox an inch and a half off the floor if you're gonna be using a hearthstone. I'll show you those when I come to it, but just so you know, when it comes to framing, you need to decide that ahead of time. As far as the rest of framing goes, you need to decide if you want it to go all the way up to the ceiling or if you're gonna stop midway and just cap it off. That's totally up to you, obviously. So in my case, I ran it right up to the ceiling, so I got a lot of stone veneer I'll be doing. But as you can see, I built it out of two by four studs as if I was building any other wall and I ran my HDMI cables in behind here because I'm gonna go put a TV up here when it's all said and done. So I'll be mounting a TV bracket as well in this video. So I got those right here. I ran this flexible pipe. So that way, if I ever need to add cables later, I can just fish, fish tape through there and pull them through. And then I got my receptacle here. So that way I can go ahead and power my TV from here without having to have cords going down the mantle and everything else. So that's just the best way I found to construct it. And it looks great that way. So now that we got all of that out of the way, let's go over the other things you need to do. After you frame and set your firebox, you need to run the gas line to it. So that's something that I recommend hiring out if you do not know what you're doing, obviously. And I also got a low voltage cable here that's gonna be for the gas logs. And from back here, we got a wire coming up to power the blower. And this and this is on a switch over here. So. This is gonna kick the fireplace off and on, and then this is gonna turn the blower off and on. So this is for the light that's above the fireplace as well, right up here. So you need to decide those things ahead of time. The next thing I need to decide is what I'm gonna do for wallboard on the fireplace. I'm gonna be using half inch sheathing that I had left over from when I framed this house. So price material went insane, so I knew I should keep these scraps for doing a project like this. And some people also use cement board, but I've never done that, but I've built several fireplaces using this half inch sheathing and I cover it with felt paper and metal lath and it turns out great for me. So that's something you're gonna to to decide what you wanna do. But for me, I like to use half inch sheathing. I'm gonna be installing the sheathing on this fireplace using this framing nailer. And as far as fasteners go, I'm gonna be using these sheathing nails. And if you've never installed sheathing before, all you gotta do is simply measure the width in which you need to rip it down to. So in this case, it's about 19 and a half. Then I'm gonna go ahead and nail those up on this side, do the same on the other side. Then I'm gonna cut them to fit in between here and then nail them off with my nailer. So we're gonna go ahead and get to doing that. 
if you're interested in purchasing any of the tools that you see in this video, I place links in the description below to most of them. And if you do make a purchase through the links, I make a small commission, but it's an extra cost to you and help support the channel. And if anyone has ever used a nail gun that's watching this can know they can be extremely dangerous. The high speed nails can cause serious injury and the loud noises that come from the nail guns can damage the ears, especially over time. So always wear ear protection. So at the beginning of this time lapse, you've seen that I forgot to have my eye protection on, but I quickly realized that and placed them over my eyes to protect them from any nail that could shear off from the sheathing. As you can see, I got the wall sheathing all over the fireplace now. So I wanted to point out that as you can see, I left about an inch and a half off the bottom here to where I stopped the plywood because I'm gonna end up having to install this hearth it's going to slide in right like that so I don't want to run my stone clear down. So that's just a nice safety reminder not to run the stone all the way down when I'm installing it. Now what I need to do is wrap this whole thing in felt paper. Let me show you how to do it. What I got here is 30 weight felt paper. I could have got away with 15 weight but I'm going to cover this plywood up on the wall and the reason why I do that is because when I put the scratch coat on I don't want the wall absorbing the moisture out of the scratch coat too quick. So a vapor barrier of some kind is going to be what I recommend and it may or may not be 100% necessary in some cases but I've always done it this way on all the fireplaces I've built and I've had no problem so I always recommend it. So when I go to do the stone on the outside I'm definitely going to use this because you definitely need a vapor barrier on the outside. Let's get started. This stuff's pretty easy to install. All I'm going to use is this cap nail gun and a utility knife. So the first thing we're going to do is go ahead and cut open the felt paper. And also, if you don't have a cap nail gun like this one, you can easily just use standard cap nails that you can get at Lowe's or Home Depot or Amazon. That's fine. So what I'm going to do is go ahead and take this down here and place it up against where the stone's going to end. Roll it out a little bit and come down here. Now I'm just going to go ahead and anchor a staple there and down the corner. I'm going to roll it out a little more first. And I'm just going to roll it right around the side of the fireplace like that and go ahead and pop one here. And then all you got to do is take your utility knife and just cut it wherever you don't need it to be. So right around the next wall like this. And then we'll go ahead and just tack it on enough to fasten it to the wall temporarily. We're going to put metal lath over this. So that's what's really going to hold that felt paper. So don't have to put a ton of cap nails in it. So the biggest thing to keep in mind is just make sure you overlap the next piece at least an inch or two and then go ahead and just tack it right where it needs to be. And just fold the edges or the corners over and then we'll secure it to the other side. Just a little information on felt paper. It's typically used on roofs as a vapor barrier or under hardwood flooring as a vapor barrier. But just so you know, it's typically just a durable weather resistant material that helps protect your roof from elements. Next thing I need to do is install the mantle brackets. One goes on each side of the firebox and these come with a bar and it also comes with the mantle bracket itself. So all I got to do is figure out the height I want the mantle bracket take a couple measurements to compensate where it laces in the back of the bracket and then mount it right to the wall of the fireplace. Let's go ahead and do it. The very first thing I had to do is decide the height in which to place the mantle. So this red line is going to be the bottom of the mantle. And then after I decided the height, I took my level and made a level line going clear across this whole fireplace because I want the other side to match this side. So you want a nice level line. And then I measured down to where this bracket's going to be located because if you look at the back of this mantle, the mantle bracket, this mantle bracket has a metal slot here in which this bar is going to go in through it like so. And then it's going to mount like this. 
Then after it's mounted, you can adjust to where you want it and then tighten up the screw in order to secure it. First thing I'm gonna do is place the bracket up where I want it. Go ahead and get it lined up about where I think I wanna keep it. And so I'm gonna go ahead and drill some pilot holes first. Now I'm just gonna take my impact driver and go ahead and anchor one in one side. And I'm gonna keep it loose for now. Now I'm gonna take the mantle bracket and go ahead and slide it over that bar and hold it about where I want it. And then I'm gonna take the screw for the other side and go ahead and anchor it. And as you can see, you can slide it to where you want it before you totally secure it. That's where I wanna keep it, so I'm gonna go ahead and tighten it up all the way. And as you can see, the bracket is in line with my red line that I made before I started installing the bracket. Now the next thing I'm gonna do is put a little torpedo level on the bracket and then I'm going to shim it until it is perfectly level. And you gotta use torpedo level here because clearly a four foot level is too much. And you always have to adjust these. I've never installed one of these before and never had to do this. And that's part of the reason why I like to install this before I put the scratch coat on. That looks good. And then I'm just gonna cut the shims and then we're good to go. I'm just gonna take my oscillating tool and cut those shims off. Next thing I'm gonna do is install the TV mounting system. And I like to do this before I do any stone or metal lath because I actually just go around it. Clearly you don't want stone and try to anchor your bracket to that. So let's go ahead and install this. Before I ran my wires, some HDMI cables and this conduit, I went ahead and got the measurements to fit after I put the mantle and everything into place. So I already got all that figured out. So I know I want my mounting bracket right on top of this tube. So I'm just gonna go ahead and make a nice level line across here. And for marking felt, a red pencil is key because you cannot see regular pencil or pen on this black felt. So after you get a level line here going, then we're gonna mount right to it. And that's gonna be the bottom of our bracket. Most TV mounting systems come with a template. And if you wanna buy this exact mounting system, check out my Amazon store in the link in the description below. And if you do make a purchase, I get a small commission, but it's at no extra cost to you. So what I'm gonna do is place the template right where I want it. And it looks like right there is on the line. And I already know where my studs are because I marked them right here with my level. And I'm gonna go ahead and make a mark where I wanna place the bolt into the stud. Now I gotta pre-drill those holes. Now that I got the holes pre-drilled, I'm just gonna set the bracket right into place. That looks good. And I'm just gonna take the bolts that came with the mounting system, go ahead and start it there. And now I'm gonna take my impact driver and sink the bolts in. Now I'm just gonna make sure we're perfectly centered. That looks good. And I'm gonna tighten them up. And then I'm gonna put some bolts into the block that's behind this eventually. I don't have them with me, but I'm gonna do that as well. So now we're nice and secured and we can move on to the next step. The final thing I like to do before I do the metal lath is mask around the fireplace because I don't wanna get mortar all over the white walls or white ceilings because I'll have to repaint it and I don't wanna do that. And also I go through with that red pencil on a level and go ahead and put a line clear up to where the studs are laid out. So that way when I nail the metal lath on, we're gonna be hitting a stud. You definitely wanna make sure you do that. Now it's time to install the metal lath. And when you buy your metal lath, make sure it's galvanized and also the fasteners you use to anchor it, make sure they're galvanized as well. You don't want it to rust out, then your stone fall off the wall. But the most important thing about this when you go to install it is there's a smooth side. If you rub your hand up and down it, you'll notice which side's smooth and which side isn't. And then as you can see, when I rub up it, it's rough. So you want the roughness to be when you slide it up the wall because you're gonna take mortar and slide it up and it's gonna cup into this, so very important. So now that you know a little bit about the metal lath, let's get to installing it. The tools I'll be using to install the metal lath is my coil nailer. A lot of people know this as a roofing nailer. This is what you use to install shingles, but it's also something you can use to install this lath. And also a pair of tin snips. 
because you're going to have to be able to cut around objects just like the felt, but in case uh, you didn't have a pair of tin snips, you can also use aviation snips. So let's go ahead and slide this into place and just go right up against the wall like so. And again, make sure it's placed correctly to where it's rough when you slide it up. And now I'm just going to go ahead and nail into a stud. And then I'm going to come over here, make sure we're properly where we need to be. And then nail into another stud. And then always like to nail this stuff every six inches up the stud. And then also I try not to nail within two or three inches from the top of it because we've got to overlap with our next piece two or three inches. So keep that in mind. And then I'll put just a handful in the fields. Just enough to keep that metal lath more flattened so it ain't so bulgy. And that looks pretty good. And now I'm gonna anchor it over here then cut around where the hearth is going. So now I'm gonna bend it around where the hearth is going and then I'm gonna cut it down. Let's do it. Now I'm going to take my 10 snips and cut it off flush with this subfloor here. And always wear gloves because this stuff is super sharp. Be very careful. For the next run, I went ahead and cut it so it fits around the mantle bracket. Just gonna go ahead and hold it down, overlapping about two inches or so, and about something like that. And I'm gonna go ahead and anchor it there. And now, I'm just gonna go ahead and work this around and anchor it as I go. Working with metal lath can be a bit tricky, but with a little practice, it's not too difficult. Definitely wear gloves and eye protection while working with it because the edges are very sharp. The first thing to know is that metal lath comes in two different types, just so you're aware. Expanding and perforated. Expanded metal lath is made by cutting slots in the metal sheets and then stretched out, which creates a diamond shaped pattern of openings that are big enough to allow like plaster or mortar or stucco to pass through. And that's what you see here. And the perforated metal lath on the other hand is made by punching holes in the metal sheets. I'm getting ready to apply the scratch coat. So as you can see, I covered everything up with masking tape and paper. So that way when all the scratch coat mortars falling, it doesn't get all over your fireplace and make a huge mess. Just a little tip. I'm out here in the garage. This is where I do all the mixing of the mortar that I'm gonna be using for my scratch coat and all the other mixing that I'm gonna be using for the stone veneer. I like to do everything in the garage when it comes to mixing of the mortar because it keeps everything contained out in the garage. Also, it doesn't throw dust up in the atmosphere that blows through the house. The dust that gets kicked up in here stays in here. Also, be sure to wear a dust mask when you're mixing up the mortar. You don't wanna inhale all that dust. It's extremely bad for your lungs. Okay, I'm gonna show you the details of the mortar and we'll get to mixing. The mortar I use for the scratch coat and the stone veneer application is type S mortar. I use clean sand that does not have debris in it, very important. I use just standard water, just make sure it's relatively clean, a five gallon bucket to do the mixing in, a half inch drill with a paddle bit or a mixing bit on it. This is relatively large, which that's what you want for mixing mortar. And also you're gonna need a shovel for measuring out for the correct ratio of the mortar. I like to use a two to one ratio when mixing up for the scratch coat. So all we gotta do is go one, and then two sands. And then I always pour my mortar into a five gallon bucket like this so I can shovel it out much easier than trying to get it out of the bag. So we'll go nice and easy here. There we go. And now we got a two to one ratio there. And then what we're gonna do is I'm gonna take my five gallon bucket of water here and go ahead and get started by placing some water in here, not too much. And then I'm gonna go ahead and mix it up 
until the consistency is like peanut butter. It's very important that you don't put too much water in here initially because you can't remove the water after it's in there. So you gotta add more product to it to dry it out. So I can clearly tell I need a little more water. So I'm gonna go ahead and place a little more water in here. Again, don't go too crazy with the water and then mix that up. Now the consistency looks good. I'm gonna make sure I mix this up for at least two to three minutes. All right, so that looks good. So what I do to remove the paddle bit is come out slow and let it throw the mortar off into the bucket. And then I place it in the bucket of water and go ahead and run it real quick. And then go reverse. So as you can see, it keeps that bit looking nice and clean or the mixer, I should say. All right, and that water might be a little dirty, but it's fine. I can use that to mix up for mortar as I go. Now I come into the house here beside the fireplace and I like to pour the mortar into a large mud tray here. And I use one of these finished trials. This is a 14 inch one. And I like to use it to place the scratch coat onto the wall. I'm gonna start by applying the scratch coat to this wall here. So what I'm gonna do is take my trowel and I like to use this large mud pan because I can just kind of scoop it up onto the trowel like so. And then I just place it right up against the wall and slide it up. Right like so. And if you remember, when we installed this metal lath, we wanted it rough when we slid up. And that's because whenever you slide your trowel against that metal lath, it's gonna absorb all that mortar. Because if you had it smooth like this, it would still take it, but it wouldn't hold the mortar nearly as good as when it's installed like this. You can just slide it right up onto the wall. Also something I found to get around areas like this mantle bracket, you can use a putty knife and it's much easier to cut in around items such as that. Applying mortar to lath is a centuries old craft that is still used today in construction in traditional masonry walls. Once the lath is hung on the wall and a thin layer of mortar is applied in this case to give me a scratch coat, but just so you're aware, you can use different thicknesses to give you a different finish if you're doing something else for a decorative wall. So you'd wanna use a thin layer for more of a smooth finish and then you'd want to use a thicker layer for more of a textured finish. But again, that's on a different subject really, but this is more for just a scratch coat, so I'm just putting a thin layer on. Now that we got the mortar applied to the whole fireplace, what we got to do now is take a stiff bristle brush and just go across it horizontally. What this stiff bristle brush does is it creates a scratch on the scratch coat and it gives a place for the mortar that's gonna be on the stone veneer to adhere to. Because if the wall is smooth, it ain't gonna adhere to the mortar quite as good. So we always go through and put horizontal striations throughout the whole scratch coat. Here's another tip. If you'd rather have your scratch coat more coarse than what that brush leaves, break off about a three inch section of coil nails and that way it'll give you a way to go across the scratch coat and leave a deeper scratch. Let me show you. As you can see, it scratches much deeper with the nails, but there's also an actual tool you can buy that do this as well. But I just wanted to show you a simple DIY thing you could do if you wanted. Before we get started on the stone veneer, I wanted to show you that most manufacturers provide two different types, the corners and the flats. The flats obviously cover the whole field of the wall and then the corners obviously go up the corners and that's what's going to create that nice illusion like it's a solid stone that's stacked up into the corner. All right, now that you know the two different types, let's get started. The scratch coat has been drying for about 24 hours. Now it's time to start the stone veneer. 
the first thing I like to do is use a level and go through about every foot and use my red pencil and mark level lines across the fireplace. That way it gives me reference lines. They don't have to be exact for spacing. They're just used, like I said, where I'm sticking the stone on, just referencing to that level line to where it's running straight. So I'll do that about every foot. That's enough lines to get started. Now what I need to do next is take my speed square and come up here to the top corner and then see what my pitch is that I got to cut that first stone down to. It roughly looks like about a 312 pitch. So we start the stone from the top and work down. That's what I prefer because when you're running your stone, if one slides off, it doesn't knock off all the stones that you started if you work from the bottom up. So I always prefer to start from the top down. Just how I prefer to do it, some people would start from the bottom up. So that's gonna be your choice and how you wanna install it. Let's go cut that first stone. So I'm out here with the wet saw that I'm gonna be using to cut this stone. So it's kind of challenging to mark this because when you're working with stone, it's not perfect, so everything's irregular. So what I'm gonna to try to do here is just do my best in the guessing the 312 pitch that I was telling you need to be cut here. So that looks close to where I'm gonna guess is right. So now I'm just gonna mark it using my red pencil. And um, that way when you use red pencil, you can see what you're marking here because gray would obviously not show up well on this stone. So we got our line here, so we're gonna cut it down using this wet saw. Always wear goggles while using the wet saw. You don't want any fine pieces of stone hitting you in the eyeball. I mixed up this batch of mortar the exact same ratio as we mixed up for the scratch coat. And here is that piece of stone that we cut earlier. So I wanna show you how I like to back butter these corners. So the first thing I do is just scoop up some mortar and then just tap it right onto the stone. And then I'll go through and just kinda butter up to make sure I cover the whole back side of it like so. And this trowel is a brick trowel. And I found that the bigger trowels are a little too much. So this is just what I prefer to use. And then we're gonna back butter the opposing side, something like so. Then I'll get the excess off like that. So I always figured about a half inch of mortar laying across the whole piece. All right, so now that we got the mortar on it, let's go stick it onto the wall. I'll warn you right off the bat that these corners are a little more tricky to do than the flats because the flats you just stick on the wall and wiggle them into place. Now these have two sides, so you gotta kinda do the same thing, but a little easier so you don't unwedge it from one side when you're trying to set the other. So all I'm gonna do is go ahead and stick it up right against the ceiling. And go nice and easy and wiggle it just so all the mortar covers the back side of that stone. Looks good, so I'm just gonna hold tension on it for just a moment, give that mortar time to adhere to the scratch coat, and then I'm gonna release. All right, so as you can see, that's stuck on there and we're good to go now. And what I'm gonna do is start from the top with these corners and run them down as far as I can go. Got my next one ready to go. And what we need to think about is how big of a mortar joint we want. I usually like anywhere from a half inch to three eighths of a mortar joint. So I'm gonna just kind of eyeball that as I stick this next one on. That looks good. And I'm just gonna keep rolling with it. You know, when it comes to home improvement projects, very few things can add as much curb appeal as new stone veneer. Whether you're looking to update the exterior of your home, give your fireplace a facelift, or build a new fireplace like I'm doing here, the investment in the stone veneer is well worth it because you cannot match the beauty of stone veneer. Before I install any more corners, I need to install the mantle because these corners come out to here and my mantle comes out to that area too. So I need to try to get around that mantle. So let's go ahead and install this. So I'm gonna set it up there first and mark around it and center it with these brackets. All right, so the first thing I'm gonna do is just set the mantle on the brackets 
And that looks pretty good there. And now what I'm gonna do is take my tape measure and center it off the edge of the mantle bracket. So right there we got about three and an eighth. Okay, so I know it needs shifted down a little bit. So let's check it there. We got about three and a half. And right there is about three and a half. That looks good. So now what I'm gonna do is just take my red pencil and mark around the mantle. So I marked around the mantle, so I'm gonna go ahead and take it off the brackets. Now I'm gonna take a tube of liquid nails. This is the heavy duty line. And I'm just gonna put liquid nails right on top of these brackets. And I'm also gonna put it right here on the scratch coat. So that way the glue is what's gonna hold that mantle into place and keep it from shifting around. Now I'm just gonna place the mantle right on top of that glue and push it tight against the wall. I'm just gonna make sure it's pushed back nice and tight. Put a little down pressure on it, make sure it's down all the way. All right, now I'm gonna put paper around it to protect it while I'm finishing up this stone. Now I'm just gonna take my hand masker and mask over this so that way it's protected while I'm finishing up this stone. Now that I'm down here a little farther on the fireplace, it's gonna be easier for you to see me do the flats and the corners. So before I show you how to do the flats, I wanna show you how to do a couple more corners so that the camera can see at a better angle. And like I said, this mortar has to have the consistency of peanut butter for it to stick the best. So the first thing I do is go ahead and just place mortar on the corner like so. And then I go ahead and push it into the corner of the piece of stone. And I go ahead and back butter the rest of it like so. And always try to do about a half inch, like I said, but always try to make an even coat across the whole thing. Because if you don't, it wants to rock back and forth when you go to install it if there's too much mortar on one side versus the other. So something like that would be a good start. But now I'm just going to take it and just go straight into the corner like so. And then I'll slowly press it on and give it a little wiggle as I press and as you can see the mortars coming out from around it and that's what you want so now that I got the corner where I want it I'm just going to hold it into place for just a moment until it kind of adheres to the wall all right now I'm just going to release slowly I try not to release abruptly and then boom that's all there is to it and what I like to do is catch the rest of this mortar that's hanging off the bottom of the pieces so that way you don't waste as much mortar that way okay so here's another corner already put a nice even coat of mortar on the back of it we're just going to slide it onto the edge nice and slow and then press it and give it a little wiggle into place and we're going to just hold it here for a moment and then slowly release and we're good to go. So now let's run the rest of this corner. And just so you're aware, I have installed stone veneer before without using corners, but I always recommend them because it makes it look way better. Something very important to do when you get down to where the hearth is going, always take a two by four block, at least in my case, the thickness of the hearth is an inch and a half, to make sure you get the correct spacing when you get to the bottom corner. And also, it's the end of the day right now. What I like to do to all my stone is go through and just clean around the edges because if you've got any humps sitting on the edges and they dry overnight, they're hard to release off the scratch coat in the morning if you need to get it out of the way for the next piece of stone. Now that I got all the corners on down to where the hearth is, I'm going to show you guys how to install the flats. And also I wanna show you what I did here on the floor before I started sticking the stones on the wall. Because the stones come in multiple shapes and sizes and colors, I like to lay several out across the floor so that way I have many options to choose from while I'm installing them on the wall. How to back butter this stone veneer is very similar to how we did the corners. All we do is turn it upside down and you'll notice a rough side and then we first just apply mortar to the back of it and try to soothe it out 
evenly across the back. Like I said, I like to have about a half inch bed of mortar going across the whole back side. And then what I do is take my trowel and spread it out evenly if there's any humps or bumps before I place it on the wall. So now all I gotta do is go up to the area in which I was wanting to install the stone, place it where I want it, and then wiggle it back and forth and even up and down a little bit in order to get that mortar spread across the back evenly and it'll kind of suction to the wall. Again, similar to how we did the corners. And then after we got a nice even amount of mortar around the back, you'll even see some come out of the bottom sometimes. And then we just hold tension on it for just a few moments. And also note, I like to keep my mortar joints about a half inch and clearly as you can see, it's irregular. It doesn't have to be exactly a half inch, obviously, because that's nearly impossible because everything's different shapes and sizes. But after you got the mortar joint or the grout joint where you want it, then go ahead and slowly release. And then that stone is installed and we're ready to go to the next one. Also, what I like to do, if there's any remaining mortar just hanging off the bottom of the stone, I'll go ahead and scrape it off there because we can save mortar that way. And also you don't want that to harden because it will be in the way of the next piece if you let it set up too long. Now, as you can see, we can either install a stone right here to finish this little run, or we can install our next stone coming from here over. So I know when I go to look on the floor, which stone I want to pick, I either need a kind of a skinnier, longer one, or kind of a medium thickness, medium length. So. I'm gonna to go to the floor and look for it. Here's the truth of installing stone. The longest, most time consuming part is trying to find the correct stone to fit in where you want it. And you can pick up any stone. And if I went to go install this up there, it would be not a good situation because your mortar joint would look really messed up because it won't fit in any one of those spots or it just wouldn't look right in general. So I need to find one of the criteria that I mentioned, like I said, a longer skinnier one or a medium medium length one and again this is definitely the most time consuming part of installing stone veneer i think anybody will tell you that now they do make panels that you can buy that have a stacked stone look that's way quicker because you don't have to do this process of looking for the correct shape and size of a stone so i'm looking across here looks like this one is a longer skinnier one so i'll take this one with me and a medium thickness, a medium length one. Um, looks like we can try this one for that one. And now let's go up here and see if these will fit. So let's start with this medium, medium thickness one. Um, so it looks like that one could work. I would re prefer it to be a little longer. But as you can see, this is my TV bracket. So I probably could get away with this one. So I th actually think this one may work here. And let's look at this skinnier one, longer one. And this one, I'm going to say will work here for sure. That looks pretty good. I like that. So I'm definitely going to go ahead and install this one. And I'm going to glance to see if I can find a better one for this situation. As you can see, I back buttered it evenly across the back side. Now I'm just going to place it into place and put some tension on it and kind of wiggle it back and forth and something like that looks good as you can see i'm relatively straight across here in comparison to this and that so that looks good and my joints here look about right at, like i said before about half inch spacing of course right here it's a little thicker of a spacing but that's okay because stone's meant to have variety in it so that looks good so i'm going to hold some tension here for just a moment more and that looks very nice, I'm gonna release, and boom, we're good. And now I'm just going to take my trowel and get the uh, excess off here, and that looks good. I went back and found this one, and here's the one I picked before. So as you can see, this one I think fits a little better. It gets a little closer to this bracket. And also I feel like the joint over there looks a little better. So I'm gonna go ahead and go with this one. So now I'm gonna back butter it and stick it on. Now we're gonna place it where we want it. Press, and again, just kind of wiggle it into place until mortar comes out around it. 
So something like that, that looks good. So I'm just gonna hold tension here for a moment. Again, the things we're looking for is trying to have like a straightish line between the top and the bottom so the stone doesn't look crooked and that looks pretty good. And as you can see, our joints look acceptable there. So there's nothing wrong with that. Now I'm gonna slowly release and boom, that stone is installed. And in this case, since we have this paper here, I can go ahead and collect this remaining mortar that falls down here on this paper as well. There's nothing wrong with recycling mortar that has not been used. Now you just repeat that process. I'll look for the next stone to fill in here and then the next stone here and then that's all there is to it. Just keep running it. And then I'll show you what I'm gonna do once I get down here to this mantle. If you could, I would recommend getting a second person to hand you the stone instead of looking for it like I'm doing here and then installing it. It would make the process go much faster and easier. What I like to do, as you can see, I put a little spacer down here so this settles into place about the right mortar joint I want. So I'm gonna go here, install the next one, slot it in very carefully, and just install it as if you're going to install, install it like normal. So we're gonna wiggle that into place. And that looks pretty good. And now what I'm gonna do is try to get the mortar out behind here because I need to be able to remove this paper later. So just kind of separate it away from the paper. That looks pretty good. And now let me get that in the right spacing that I want. So something like that. And now I'm just going to take this little, this is just scrap mortar chip, but a shim or anything would work just to kind of hold it into place where I want it, then release. And uh, I just like to be able to use the leverage of this mantle while I can, just keep everything looking uniform. Now I'd like to show you how I finish up around the floor. What I like to do is I just take two half inch pieces of sheathing and stack them on top of each other to give me one inch because I have three quarter hardwood floor that's gonna be going under this stone. So it gives it appearance like you installed the stone on top of the hardwood floor. So that's gonna be the best way to get a good finish without having the floor installed first. So who wants to do all the stone work with flooring already installed? I definitely don't want to. So now I wanted to show you that once, once this stone's installed, it's gonna be laying tight against that one inch piece of wood. And again, after I take those out, the three quarter floor goes under it. So it gives me just a little gap. So it's gonna give it a nice sleek appearance. So I'm gonna go ahead and install the rest of these here. And these are the last few pieces of stone on this fireplace. And here's the great part about the bottom pieces. I already installed these corners so they set up so I have a place to put a little shim to hold that in a place until it sets up. So you don't have that opportunity when you're working from the top down, but I already installed, like I said, these corners. So whenever I have an opportunity like that, I do it. So if you look here, I got a little shim here too, that's mortar because this corner already dried. And like I said, sometimes it's just nice to have that little help when you're doing this by yourself. And when you're installing these right here where the hearth is going, you definitely wanna make sure you're hanging below a little bit. So that way the hearth stone doesn't sit right on top of the stone. We wanna leave just about a quarter inch to a half inch gap, just like we did around all the other stone. All right, all the stones installed on the fireplace and now I gotta let it set up for 24 hours at least before I go through and point all this with the mortar. And also another tip as well, Right here where the hearth is going, just like we did the corners here, I always lay a two by four block underneath of where the stone's going. So that way I know exactly where that hearth is gonna sit so I know the reveal I need. So similar to what we did on the floor with the sheathing, except up here's a two by four because the hearth is thicker. Now that all the stone is installed on the fireplace, I'm gonna go through with a grout bag and put mortar in between all the joints. Now I'm gonna show you how I mix up my mortar for the grouting process. And before we start the grouting process, I wanna let you know that grouting the stone is a very subjective process. 
There's many ways to do the grouting of the stone, and I'm gonna show you the method I like to use and the look that I like. So this might be totally different than what you want, but I'm just gonna go ahead and show you. So be sure to see exactly what you want before you start. So I already did a couple of mixtures to see what grout I like the most. So what I ended up using was this charcoal color, cement color right here, I'll show you up close. So this is made by Cy Creek, and the mixture that I found that worked best for me was using three tablespoons of this per five gallon bucket of water right here. And then I mix it up thoroughly before I mix up my mortar. And the biggest thing to remember about mixing up grout is you need to keep consistency very important. So this mortar that I'm using and this sand that I'm using is all out of the same brand and the same batch and the sand is out of the same pow. So that way everything stays the same and I even measure out the water exactly the same too because it has the color in it. So more or less water is gonna change the look of the grouting. So that's very important. And also the technique that you use to apply it to the wall is gonna determine the color it gives you as well. So again, I'm gonna show you exactly what I do. So you may wanna do it like this, you may not. So see what I got for you. Make your own judgment. When I mix up the mortar for the other mixture to apply the stone veneer to the wall and the scratch coat, I just measured everything out with the shovel. But this case, I'm gonna use this five quart bucket. So that way it's measured out exactly the same measurements each time. So what I'm gonna do is go ahead and fill up this bucket to the top and then level it out with two buckets total for the sand. So we're gonna use the same ratio of sand to mortar so we're gonna do a two to one mixture, and then I'm gonna go ahead and pour that into my mixing bucket. And then again, I'm gonna go ahead and do another one. And now I'm going to do the same with the mortar, but I'm just gonna do one bucket full. All right, now I got a bucket of mortar. And now I'm going to stir my water up thoroughly here. Get the color mixed up in it really well. And I mixed this up the other day, so it's already mixed to what I wanted. So I put three tablespoons of that color into this water. And now I'm gonna dip out water the exact same amount in each time I make up this mixture. The mixture I used took seven solo cups, so I know that I need two buckets of sand each time and one bucket of mortar, and then seven solo cups full of that water. And now you're gonna notice that this is a little thinner than what we used to apply the stone veneer, but that's the consistency I like to use so the mortar flows out of the grout bag much easier. But you don't want it too watery to where it's just like water, but you just want it kind of thin. And now I mix it up really thoroughly for about five minutes because you want this stuff mixed very well. I'm over here by the fireplace and now before I start grouting, I get what's called a soil scooper. It's just a regular gardening tool, but I found out that this is much better to use than a trowel for trying to get mortar into a grout bag. But if all you got is a trowel, that's fine too. But all we gotta do is take the grout bag, set it beside the bucket of grout or mortar and just fill up the bag just about a halfway full you don't want to overfill it because it's kind of hard to handle it first so what i do is just go ahead and put about five scoops in it and then i'm all loaded up and then i'll be ready to squeeze the grout into the joints so after you got your desired amount in the grout bag all we got to do is just let the bottom come down now I'll pinch the bottom like this and let it fill up clear down to the tip. And then what I do is I'll twist this top shut like so, just like a big cake batter bag. It's really the exact same idea. So we'll get this thing ready like this. And now when I push on the end, you'll see mortar will come out like that. So now all I gotta do is go to the joints and fill it in the desired amount that I want. So there's so many ways to fill it up, but I'll show you what I'm gonna do. Started from the top at the ceiling and worked my way down 
and I went ahead and did that so that way you can see at a better angle instead of with the camera pointed up. But as you can see, I went ahead and got a good bead going through here. And sometimes it helps to cut the tip of these bags off because they're very small when you first buy them. So I noticed if I cut a little bit off, it seems to be about right. But all you gotta do with it is go ahead and get right in the joint and push just as if, again, you're doing a cake batter type situation and you're gonna spread it right into that joint. And that's why you wanna make this stuff a little on the liquidy thin side is so it comes out of this bag easy. And again, this is subjective, so you fill it up as much as you want, but I like to keep it to where my stone looks pretty detailed. So I like to hold it back into the stone a little bit. So about like that. And as you can see, it just flows right around all the stones like so and try not to get it on the face of the stone i got a little bit on it there but you want to squeeze it to where you don't smear it all over the stone and now i'm just going to go through and try to get all the crevices filled right like so really nothing to it and this takes way less time to do um, compared to actually stoning the wall so this is the easy part. And then we'll have to let this set up for about two or three hours, and then I'll show you what to do next. I do recommend moving relatively quickly while installing the grouting, and that's because the longer the bucket of mortar sets, the stiffer the mortar gets, which makes it harder to go through the grout bag, and especially in the tiny crevices of the stone veneer. This has been setting for about two or three hours and the tool I'm going to be using is a three inch brush. This is just an old cheap brush but has a plastic end on it so that way I can go through and scratch across here without scratching my stone. So this is set up about to where I want it, enough to be a little pliable, it might be on a little bit of a dry side but not too bad. So all you got to do here is just scratch and tuck that mortar up around the stone. So I'm just kind of pushing all these edges up around it and just cleaning out the bulk of that mortar. Again, this is the look I like. There's no right or wrong thing to do here. It's just the look that I like. So I'm just going to scrape and just tuck it in along the stone, something like that. And you got to work kind of fast because you've got just a window of opportunity here to clean this grout out because if it sets up too long, especially if you're working outside, this stuff can set up really quick and it's not going to be what you want if you uh, mess around too long, you'll set up too fast. So something like that. And then after I get it rough like that, I just take just my glove, my hand, with my glove and just flatten it out something like that and then I'll just take the brush side then just kind of clean it off so that is the look that I like and I'm not going to go across here too much because it'll make this look kind of light through here if you just keep going so I just kind of clean it and go on so something like that So unlike applying the grouting into the joint, finishing it I recommend you taking your time and doing it right because you really only get one go at this because if it sets up too long and you don't have it pointed in around the stone correctly, it's going to be very tough to do it later and then you don't want to try to mix new mortar over old mortar. It might not turn out as good if you just did it right the first time. That took me 12 hours and almost 20 gallons of grout to do this whole fireplace. I'm exhausted, but as you can see, everything's nice and uniform and dark looking, but after it dries, it's gonna lighten up a good bit. So we're gonna let this dry overnight and then we're gonna come back and do the hearth. So let's see what it looks like in the morning. And we're back here the next day in the morning. So as you can see, like I said, the grout lightened up a little bit and it'll probably lighten up the more as the day and days go on. 
but everything looks nice and uniform and that's what you want. So now let's go ahead and work on the hearth and let me show you how I install my hearth. This is the hearth stone I'm gonna be using for the hearth. It's rough measurements is 20 by 19. And if I take a measurement here to how wide I actually need it, I'm gonna to want to cut all these down to about 18 and a quarter inch. That's the widest part of where this lip is. So I want it to be flush after I install this with that lip. That's the look I like. Some people like a little bigger overhang. So after I install it like that, it's gonna give an illusion of an overhang anyways because it's a little bit jagged in and out through here. So that's the look I want. So again, it all depends on what you want. So I'm gonna to go to the wet saw and rip all these down first. After cutting the first hearthstone on the wet saw, I realized my cut was not really that straight. So I resorted to getting a diamond tip blade and using a straight edge clamp down onto the hearth and cutting it outside because a lot of dust was formed. And then I washed it off afterwards to give me a clean look. I carried the hearthstone into the house, set it where it needs to be set, and I spaced them out evenly and I have them sitting exactly where I want them. And what you might have to do, which I had to do in this case, is I had to take shims and find out places where it's wobbling to try to even it out. And then I took a straight edge to check to see if they are the same plane because it's kind of like tile. You want it setting flat and level. So I already went through and did all that so everything looks really good. So now all I gotta do is take liquid nails, put underneath the hearthstone and set it in the place exactly where it came from setting here. This one doesn't have any shims under it so I can slide it right off here. Then it's gonna set it here to the side. And now I'm gonna put a liberal amount of liquid nails. This is the same liquid nails I used to install the mantle. So it's the heavy duty line. And now I'm gonna go ahead and put a adequate amount under here because this is ultimately what's holding the hearthstone into place. So I definitely want to make sure I got plenty underneath of it. That looks good. Again, it's a lot, but I want this to be setting and locked into place forever. All right. I feel it kind of floating just as if it was setting on water and I'm just going to kind of wiggle it down into place okay and I'm going to set it right back where it came from all right nothing wrong with that so now I'm going to go to the next one do the exact same thing now this one has shims that I got to keep under here because I needed it to level it up so now I'm going to do the exact same situation here And now that I have them all setting into place, I'm going to go through and double check, make sure they all line up and everything looks really good before I leave the site. As you can see, all of the joints look nice and even. And now I'm going to let this set up for 24 hours before I grout around it because there are spots just like here that need filled in and clearly the joints and right here around the fireplace. So again, make sure you let this stuff set up for 24 hours first or your stones will shift while you're trying to grout them. Just in case you were wondering, the manufacturer of the gas logs and the firebox is by a company named Superior and the stone veneer was manufactured by a company named Eldorado, Eldorado Stone. And I am not affiliated with either one of those, but I knew somebody would wonder where they came from. And now what I'm doing is just finishing up that grouting on that hearth and all you do is fill in the cracks and gaps just like the stone. The stone veneer application on the fireplace is complete. And if you stuck with me throughout this whole video, you are awesome because this was a really long video. And what I'm gonna do at a later date is wipe off all the stone veneer with some warm water just to make sure it's extra clean. And if you haven't yet done it, check out the link in the description below to my Amazon store. There you'll find a lot of supplies and tools I use to build this fireplace. And if you haven't yet done it, also check out my other videos on this channel. There's a bunch of DIY videos. I built my whole house on film and it's pretty cool to watch all the videos and the building process as I went. And again, I wanna say thank you. And if you wanna see a video on how to plumb your own bathroom, check out this video, it'll help you out.